today in our readings and in our hymns, Jesus is revealed to be the great light to us. So be on the lookout for that today as we work uh, through our, our worship folder. Jesus is indeed our great light. May God bless our time together in his word. We begin with our opening hymn, hymn number 90, The People That in Darkness Sat. Please stand. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. The glory of Christ is revealed. Let us worship him.
Our first reading is from Isaiah chapters 8 and 9. When someone tells you to consult the mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam throughout the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. The word of the Lord. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 27. We'll sing Psalm 27 together in unison. Our second reading is from 1 John chapter 2. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. 
Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going, but the darkness has blinded them. The word of the Lord. Please stand. Alleluia. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 4. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We continue with our hymn of the day, hymn number 85, O God from God, O Light from Light.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In Matthew chapter 4, we see the beginnings of Jesus' public ministry up in Galilee. We see Jesus going about calling the masses of people to repentance. We see Jesus going from synagogue to synagogue, teaching and preaching. We see Jesus healing all sorts of diseases and injuries and making people whole again. We also see here that Jesus begins to gather a small group of followers to himself. And there's no doubt in my mind that this group that Jesus begins to assemble truly was a small group. No doubt that most of those people who heard Jesus' proclamation rejected him and did not wind up following him in faith. Well, in Isaiah chapter 8 and 9, our Old Testament reading that we heard a moment ago, Isaiah describes for us what happens both to those who do follow Jesus and what happens for those who do not follow Jesus. Now, Isaiah chapter 8 begins with a handful of warnings. The Lord God comes to Isaiah and he gives him a heads up. He says, Isaiah, do not give in to the wicked and ungodly influence in Israel. It is everywhere. It is all around you. Isaiah, watch out for it. These people are going to come to you and say this devastation and this destruction that, that is about to come. It's all God's fault. God is being unfair. God is being unjust. They will tell you this, but Isaiah, don't listen to it. These are, are nothing other than harmful conspiracies. Stay away. The Lord God also warns Isaiah to be on his guard against the false teachers and the false prophets in Israel. The Lord God says, Isaiah, they will tell you to consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter. These people will tell you, Isaiah, you, you've got these spiritual challenges, as do all the people in Israel. Why don't you just go and, and find those people who conjure up the dead, who, who try to consult people who long ago died? Surely, surely they will have answers and guidance for you. Well, of course, the Lord God responds to this foolishness. The Lord God asks, should a people not consult their God? Israel. You have a God who revealed himself to you on Mount Sinai. Israel, you have a God who sent his prophets to you again and again to proclaim his word. Israel, you have a God who dwells among you in Jerusalem's temple. Why, Why don't you just consult him? Why would you ask anybody else for help? Why would you ask for, for any clearance in these spiritual matters from anyone other than your God? It doesn't make any sense. God further asks, why would you consult the dead on behalf of the living? Israel, you've got your problems right now. You've got your spiritual struggles. You are living through it. You are experiencing it. What on earth are dead people who are not experiencing the same things as you? What on earth are they going to do? How are these dead spirits going to help you out? The Lord God says the, the practices of these false prophets, these false teachers, they're just plain foolish. There is absolutely no reason why you should ignore your God and look to them instead. Instead of consulting these false prophets, these mediums, and these spiritists, the Lord God simply directs his people to his written word, to his revealed will, as it had come through Moses and the prophets. The Lord God says, to the law, to the word of testimony. If Isaiah had been writing this in 2023, he would have simply said, to the Bible, to the Holy Scriptures, that is the truth. The words that God speaks are the, the guide and the light for you. God further says, if these prophets don't speak according to the light of his word. Well, Isaiah says there's no light of dawn for them. In other words, if these prophets aren't going to speak according to God's word, they don't speak light. They only speak darkness. All they do is lie, is lie and there is no truth 
in them. These false prophets speak according to their own whims. They speak according to the desires in their own heads and their own hearts. They've turned away from the Lord. And Isaiah describes the dreadfulness that awaits these false prophets and all who would follow after these false prophets. Just consider what Isaiah says here. They will pass through the land distressed and starving, but when this takes place and they are starving, they will be frustrated, and they will curse their king and their god. They will turn their faces upward, and then they will look down to the ground. But I tell you, they will see only distress, darkness, and the gloom that brings anguish. They will be banished into thick darkness. These occult leaders, and all who follow after the teachings of these occult leaders, in the end, they will only find burden after burden. The goal to to have their spiritual needs, their spiritual desires satisfied, but they won't find what they're looking for. Even in their darkened states, yes, they will run to the king, they will run to God, two entities who could have helped them out, but in, in their darkened understanding, they won't find what they're looking for. No, in their darkened understanding, all they will do is create more and more darkness for themselves. They will even go so far is to blaspheme their king and their God. And sure, these false teachers and and their, their followers, they'll continue to prod about the heavens. They'll look about the earth searching, but they won't find what they need. These false teachers will not find the comfort and the solace and the hope that they look for. No, they will only be misguided. They'll be left confused. They will be left without hope. And if these false prophets do not repent, if those who listen to the false prophets do not repent, they will be banished in darkness, sent to the deepest darkness, sent to a place where absolutely no light can go. That would be the prison and the dungeons of hell. So God gives a a very severe warning here, a very stern warning to these people. And it's very sad that these people did not listen. So many people in Israel did decide to follow after these false prophets. So many of these people did consult the mediums and the spiritists, even though God told them exactly what would happen if they did. And in doing so, in turning away from God and and pursuing the false ideas and the false teachings of the day, the nation of Israel had plunged itself into darkness and doom and despair and gloom. And yes, the wrath of God was coming upon them. In this case, the wrath of God would be carried out against them by the hands of the Assyrian armies. Punishment and judgment surely were coming on the house of Israel. Nevertheless, God says, there will be no more gloom for the nation that would be in anguish. Even though that generation of Israelites had been incredibly faithless and incredibly wicked, God was still going to demonstrate his faithfulness to them. God had made his covenants with Abraham. He had made his covenants with David. And he was not going to go back on those covenants, no matter how wicked and rebellious that nation had become. Yes, in the former times, God did humble Zebulun. He did humble Naphtali, two two territories that were up in the northern portion of Israel, two border territories that were always under the threat of foreign invaders, always under the threat of foreign siege works and, and so forth. And yes, God did humble them. God brought them to their knees as he sent the Assyrians to ravage them. But the fortunes of Zebulun and Naphtali, they would completely turn around. In the latter times, Isaiah writes, God will cause it to be glorious along the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. This land that had been inhabited by so many outsider Gentiles Her people 
who had been so mired in false doctrine and false practice, a land that ultimately was destroyed, would have everything turned around. Her fortunes would completely change. She was walking in darkness in the former times. In the latter times, God would hold her with a special place of honor. God would give her a special glorification, and her name again would be great. The people walking in that darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light would indeed dawn. The lands of Zebulun and Naphtali. It may have seemed like those territories were always in a perpetual state of doom and gloom, but a beacon of hope would appear for her. God was going to send a great light her way. A great light that could pierce through the ugly, deep darkness that had overshadowed her for so long. A light was coming. And Isaiah speaks of further cause for rejoicing that the Lord God was going to give to her. He writes, You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you like the joy at harvest time, like the celebration when people divide the plunder. The nation had been devastated and decimated. Its population had been killed or taken away. But the Lord God was going to bring a people back to this land. The Lord God was going to bring Israel back. He was going to cause them to grow. He was going to make their population increase tenfold. And God was going to continue to bring joy upon joy upon joy to his nation. The Lord God would bring an exceedingly great kind of joy. The kind of joy, as Isaiah says here, that follows a a long and difficult harvest season. The kind of joy that accompanies or or follows after a, a terrible, horrendous war. God was going to do this great thing for them. How was God going to do that? Well, he was going to break the rod that had oppressed them. He was going to shatter the yoke and the bar that had put these people in slavery. Just as he had done in the days of Midian, so too was God going to perform another great miracle to deliver his people. At that time, the Lord God had delivered his people With only 300 fighting soldiers, they they took on and defeated the armies of Midian that numbered over 120,000. God truly had performed a miracle to deliver, and he was going to do so again. God was going to so thoroughly defeat and destroy those enemies who had oppressed his people for so long. God was going to destroy the shackles that had held them, God was going to crush the cages and the prisons in which his people were held captive. In just a few verses after our Old Testament reading ends, God tells us how he was going to do that. God shows us exactly how he was going to grant relief and restoration to his faithless people. God was going to grant that release through a little child A little child who would rule over his people with complete and absolute authority. No one was ever again going to come in and harm God's people. That little child would reign on David's throne forever and ever, establishing and upholding justice for his people, bringing in this thing that they had not seen for so long. This little child would be so great, so special, so noteworthy that he would be called wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This little child was the key to Israel's salvation. This little child was the beacon of hope. This child was the great light that would pierce and penetrate the darkness that had surrounded God's people. That little child came to Israel on Christmas Day. That little child suffered and died and took up his life again three days later so that he might release Israel from her captors. So you see, after everything that had occurred in Israel, after the idolatry, all the rebellion, the destruction and devastation, God still kept his word. 
God stayed faithful to his faithless nation. God glorified these people. God brought joy back into their hearts. He put smiles back on their faces. Messiah Jesus came to the nation of Israel. What a story it is. What a declaration we find here in Isaiah 8 and 9. God stays faithful even if we remain faithless. That, of course, plays out so clearly in the prophets, in the writings of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, in the writings of the gospel in the New Testament. We see how this faithfulness plays out. We see how God keeps his promises to his people. And let me tell you, this faithfulness, we still see it playing forth in our lives too. Now maybe, just maybe, we would be a little tempted to look upon Isaiah's eight, Isaiah 8 and 9 and say, well, yeah, but my homeland isn't under threat from the Assyrian armies. I don't go to the mediums and the sorcerers and the spiritists and palm readers and things of that nature to have my spiritual needs fulfilled. Well, this may be true. This may be true. But I can assure you that these words that Isaiah speaks here are just as real and relevant for us now as they were when these first words were spoken over 2,700 years ago. For these threats and promises that God makes in these verses are indeed the same threats and promises that he makes right now. In Isaiah 8 and 9, of course, Isaiah directs us to the great light. Isaiah directs us to the one who grants release from oppression and slavery and sin and death. And Satan, Isaiah, shows us all of this here. He says such a figure is indeed coming. When Matthew chapter 4, of course, we heard how uh, these prophecies were fulfilled, and we hear through whom these prophecies were fulfilled. You know, Isaiah speaks a whole lot about the glorification of Zebulun and Naphtali, the, the region of Galilee. He speaks about joy. He speaks about restoration. Well, Matthew tells us how all of that stuff takes place. The Lord Jesus lived most of his life up in northern Israel, Zebulun and Naphtali, a territory now simply known as Galilee. The Lord Jesus came from that place, brought God's glory again to it. The Lord Jesus began his public ministry up in Galilee. And of course, throughout his public ministry, don't we see how Jesus was a light for the people? Don't we see how Jesus was a light for the nations? Matthew directed us to the healings of Jesus in the fourth chapter of his gospel. Just think about how many people how many bodies existed at that time that were darkened by sin, darkened by disease and illness and corruption? Well, how many of those bodies did Jesus heal? How many of those bodies saw the light? So many, as Matthew tells us. Every disease, every illness, Jesus cast it away. And all of those healings, those miracles that Jesus performed to fix other people, don't they remind us of the final deliverance that the Lord Jesus promises to us? Don't they remind us that he is coming back again to make everything new? Don't they remind us that Jesus is coming back to, to change us, to glorify us, to remove all sin and all of sin's influence from us so that we might be made new, so that we might be made fit to spend eternity with him, that we might dwell with God forever and ever? Yes, those healings, they show us the light. Yes, those healings direct us to that deliverance that Jesus is going to grant us once and for all on the new day. And don't we also see during his public ministry how Jesus shattered oppression? Don't we see how he destroyed the chains and the bars that held his people? When in former times you and I were under the domain of the prince of darkness, born in sin, given over to sin, doing nothing but sinning and having no desire other than to rebel against God. When we were in that state, 
The Lord Jesus suffered and died to redeem us. That is, the Lord Jesus suffered and died to set us free from sin's chains, to deliver us over to God and make us free to serve him with gratitude and with joy. Of course Jesus is the light. Of course Jesus is the one who frees us from oppression. That light, that liberator that Isaiah talks about in chapter 8 and 9, he truly has come to earth. And we've seen him. We follow Jesus in faith. May we continue to follow Jesus in faith. Well, what does that look like exactly? Well, it, it means feasting on this bread of life from heaven as often as we can. As often as Jesus gives us that opportunity to hear his word. As often as Jesus gives us that opportunity to eat and drink his body and blood. As often as Jesus gives us opportunity to remember our baptism when we were washed and cleansed. May we feast on this bread of life. And Jesus will bless that. Jesus will increase your faith. He will strengthen you. Following after Jesus in faith also means that we ought to be careful with the other kinds of spiritual food which we would consume for our souls. Recall the testimony that the Lord God had spoken to those mediums and spiritists in Isaiah chapter 8. He gives them a thorough rebuke and says, this is poison for your soul. And then he directs them to the law and to the testimony. He directs them to his word. The word of God, these holy scriptures, the Bible, they really are a guide for us in spiritual matters. These words of scriptures really do serve as a judge for us in determining what would be beneficial for our souls and also what would be harmful for our souls. And brothers and sisters, we need to use God's word as a judge more than you might realize. Because this sinful, ungodly influence is everywhere. And no, this sinful and ungodly influence doesn't just arise from the occult. It doesn't arise just from the false religions like Muhammad and Buddha. It doesn't arise just from the culture around us. Sometimes sinful and ungodly influence even arises within the church militant on earth. Jesus himself teaches that people will come along mixing their own errors that they devised in with the truth. Just as we heard God declare a moment ago, not every teaching that claims to be good has the light of dawn in it. Jesus also teaches us to be on guard because these false teachers who mix their truth in, uh, mix their error in with the truth, they're really ferocious wolves. They may come to you wearing a disguise that makes them look like harmless sheep, but they are not. These false teachers, they might mix their error with some truth. They might mix their error with a lot of truth. But would you regularly consume food that was only 10% moldy? The point I'm trying to make here is this. Let us exercise extreme caution as we pursue other spiritual resources to aid us in our study and in our growth. Let us not be so naive as to think, well, the author of this book calls himself a pastor, therefore it must be good for me. Let us not be so naive as to think, well, the group who put out this movie or this documentary or this song claims membership to a Christian organization, therefore this must have some benefit. Again, false teachers will arise within the church. The Lord Jesus says this. And again, not every teaching has the light of dawn in it. And if we consume rotten and moldy spiritual food, well, it could lead to destruction and devastation and darkness, just as it had done for the nation of Israel. So what ought we to do then? What shall we do? Ungodly influence is everywhere. Might even arise from within God's people. 
Well, the answer to that, of course, is going to be get in the scriptures. Be students of that word. Hear the Lord Jesus speak to you through the words on those pages. See the Lord Jesus illumine you with his light that pierces darkness. Be in the word. Hear the shepherd's voice. Be just like those noble Berean Christians. We meet those Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and and they so diligently studied God's word. They so intensely studied God's word. And the reason why they did that was so that they might test the doctrine and the practice that even St. Paul the Apostle had been bringing to them. Brothers and sisters, be those Bereans. Be students of God's word. And as you pursue resources to help you grow in your faith, as you pursue those resources that might help you in your understanding and knowledge of Scripture, be discerning. And know know that if those voices dim the light of Christ in any way, if those voices obscure the glory of Christ at all, if those voices would deny any aspect of your salvation whatsoever, Those voices are speaking darkness to you, and do not follow them. Dear saints of God, today we have heard the voice of the Lord Jesus speak to us through his holy prophets and apostles. We've heard the Lord Jesus extend his call to us, come and follow me. May we do so more and more as we be students of his word, as we see his light dawn upon us. May we heed his call. And may we see the joy of his salvation. God be praised. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We join to sing the Te Deum.
may be seated. We continue as we gather our offering. Please stand. In the morning, O oh Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, you sent your Son to proclaim your kingdom and to teach with authority. Anoint us with the power of your Spirit that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated. We continue with our closing hymn, hymn 279.
Once again, good morning to you all. It was a pleasure to meet with all of you here and to hear and proclaim God's word together with all of you. 